you do not want to miss tomorrow. I want to thank all of my guests today. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. on an all-new Dr. Phil. Dating app. There was a coffin in the middle of his bedroom. Horror stories. I actually found my date hiding under my bed. Before you swipe right. He started to strangle me. Beware. I was covered head to toe in blood. He attempted to cut off both of my hands and other parts of me to have as food. He was going to eat parts of your body. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. Get ready to take care of you. Now, you know, I'm pretty entrepreneurial. Got a lot of companies I do, and I have an opportunity for you if you want to invest. I've come up with a completely new way for you to meet somebody in your life. Now, there are a few problems. 10% of them are going to get their drinks spiked. 40 to 50% of them will be sexually harassed. But if you say it real quick, it doesn't sound real bad, right? Half will get inappropriate pictures sent to them. And they will get addicted, and they'll spend 10 hours a week working on this, whether they want to or not. And some of them are gonna get ripped off and scammed for all their money. Think you can sell this? No? Well, come on. You're so negative. <laughs> Well, somebody's selling this because it's really not new. It's an idea that has 300 million users. I'm talking about dating apps. Now, many people are too naive and vulnerable to see red flags, and that's the problem. Take a look. Nearly one in three Americans have gone online to find a partner. Dunphy says she met Mark Papa Michael on Plenty of Fish. She had no idea he was registered as a sex offender. Dunphy says she felt comfortable and went to Papa Michael's house, where she says he raped her. Sex crimes detectives surprised 21-year-old Sean Rickard and arrested him behind a shopping center. Officials say the Anaheim man thought he was going to meet the 12-year-old girl he'd allegedly sexually assaulted Monday. It's a girl he met on Tinder. Debbie Montgomery Johnson signed up for an online dating service. Johnson says she and Cole engaged in a two-year online relationship but never met in person. She gave Cole more than a million dollars in increments. At this point, I was doing what my heart wanted me to do. Police say a man met someone on a dating app who sent him nude pictures and then said she was under 18. He then got a call from someone claiming to be a police officer investigating him about those photos. And then a call from the girl's father telling him to send more than $1,000 on a cash app, but the man realized it was all a scam. But stories like these really haven't discouraged app users as more and more people sign up to swipe right. Experts say it has become an addiction like slot machines designed to never fully quench a person's dating desires. Dating apps are definitely the most common way for our generation to be meeting people. The worst experience on any dating apps I've had is I was gonna go on a date with a girl and then she was, said she was late. So she was like, order me this. So I went to the bathroom and when I came back, all the food was gone and I was ghosted. I gave her a free meal, but I never met her. I've been catfished before. You know, I met up with someone who wasn't in the photos. I instantly just got in my car and drove away. Not only was it not the same picture, um, it, it wasn't the same gender as a photo. I've definitely encountered people using fake photos. The fake photos are obvious because they're really grainy and it's like a model from like Italy. I know someone that just got engaged and they met on Tinder. You get this jolt when like someone <laughs> swipes 
on you, that they find you attractive. You're just not getting that yeah. in person. I got addicted to the dating apps. We've actually downloaded them together as kind of a joke. Mm -hmm. We are sitting in our room trying to figure out how to spice up our, our, our love life. <laughs> Now, my first guest, Jewel, says she just moved to L.A. and was lonely, so she downloaded a dating app. I got invited on a date, and I was like, sure, why not? Worst decision of my life. We'll call him Greg. So I get there, and we take a dog on a walk. Get back to his house, and there's a car waiting in the driveway. <gasps> a girl. It's a girl. She rolls out the window and starts screaming at me, at me, not even at him. I'm the Girlfriend, like, what the f you think you are? I'm like, what is going on? I don't, I do not know who you are. Then she starts swinging at me. She doesn't care at this point, and she is taking it all out on me and not on him. Jules, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. So this was your first date with this person. Yes, very first date. And he didn't mention that he had a girlfriend. Oh, absolutely not. So you had no idea? No idea. So you're out walking the dog, and when you started getting close, did he see the car in the driveway? I saw him look at a car before me, and then I turned around, and that's when I saw. Okay, when he saw the car, did he say anything to you? Did he explain he said like nothing. Uh, He just let you walk right up on it? Yep, exactly. And did he know she was in there? Well, he did when she rolled down the window and they all started screaming at me. Oh, there were more than one. Oh, it was a car full of girls. She started yelling from the car or she got out? She started yelling from the car at first and then she got out and her friends were behind her and she came really close to me and tried to fight me. What did you do? I ran back to my car. <laughs> okay, so you took off? Yeah, I took off. Yeah, good thinking. Yeah, I thought that was the end of it, but... Yeah, it wasn't. No. <laughs> what happened next? She got my number from his iCloud, and she started texting me nonstop. As it turned out, that was the best of your oh, that dating was... experiences in the beginning, right? That was nothing compared to. Because the next one made you miss this guy. Oh, 100%. What happened on the next one? So I actually found my date hiding under my bed. Well, that's not how you met. I met him on a dating app. Things were fine. He seemed sweet. I developed feelings for him. One night, I decided to go out, and he's texting me, asking me where I am. And um, he's a little concerned. He thinks I'm with other guys, which I'm not. I'm with my roommate. I find my key card to my apartment is missing. I don't think anything of it because I lose stuff a lot get back to my apartment, go to sleep, wake up to him crawling out from under my bed and standing over me. So your key card didn't go missing, he took it? Yes, he stole it from me. Okay, you went to bed not knowing he was under the bed? Oh, absolutely not. He went into my apartment while me and my roommate were out. Okay, and he, that's your bed? Yep, there it is. So he hid behind those drawers for hours. Creep meter <laughs> is pegging over here. So he hides under your bed behind those drawers for hours. Yes. And you, you're you in bed asleep. Yes, he thought that he was going to catch me come home with another guy. That's why he did it. And what was his plan then? What was he gonna do when you? I'm happy I didn't find out. Did you ever report this? No, but after telling the story a few times, now I think I should. Well, there's a statute of limitations on these things. Yeah. And that's, that's the illegal entry. Yes. And then it, he stalked you mm -hmm. in real life. Right. I mean, not just call, you know, texting you and that sort of thing. And you might want to consider reporting this and right. getting a restraining order or something on it. Because who knows what could happen. Exactly. So I, I want you to be safe. That's, that's the main thing. You'll understand what I mean when I introduce this next story. Strangled, stabbed, and left for dead. A college student's cautionary tale of trusting someone too quickly from a dating app. We'll meet him next. He sliced the side of my throat. He attempted to cut off both of my hands. 
to keep my hands as trophies and other parts of me to have as food. He was going to eat parts of your body? Yes. date with someone and at the end of the night I guess he decided that the date was over and just like ran down the street okay bye and then literally like just like watched him run down an avenue just like run into the night so like I text him after and I was like did you just run away it's like yeah but we never dated again well we're talking about crazy dating app stories and some of these like somebody just turning and running away into the night can be kind of ridiculous but funny. And some of these can obviously be really involved, dangerous, and dark. After talking for a month on a dating app, Holden made plans for a first date. What was supposed to be a fun night, just playing video games, turned into the absolute worst nightmare you could possibly imagine. Holden was kidnapped, strangled, stabbed, and almost murdered. He ended up in a coma for three days and barely survived to tell his story. So joining us virtually is Holden. Uh, Holden, thank you so much for joining us today and talking about this. Thank you so much for having me. Holden, you met this person on a dating app, and you guys talked for a while and then you made a plan to go play video games at his father's home, is that right? Yeah, so we had talked for approximately a month, and we, the main plan was to go to his father's house while his father was offshore and play video games. He proposed a sexual encounter with handcuffs. I didn't know if he really wanted to have sex or not, but he did propose the encounter with handcuffs, so I agreed, and from there... He put the handcuffs on me, and after that, he started to threaten me with a pistol. He, he goes to put the gun away, then he comes back, and he he pulls out a belt and starts to... He started to strangle me. And how long did this go on? Uh, he strangled me probably for about 30 to maybe even longer, um, basically to the point of every blood vessel in my face, like up from the belt around my neck, um, every blood vessel ruptured due to the severity of how he was strangling me. I'm so sorry to hear this happen to you. Now, you, you eventually lost consciousness, right? Yeah, I lost consciousness. And while I was unconscious, he stripped me naked. Um, it's unknown if I was raped or not while I was unconscious because there was never a rape kit given. Um, but while I was unconscious, he put me into a bathtub and that's where he began to start the mutilation of my arms or my hands and other parts of my body. I was covered kind of head to toe in blood. So in total, he had put six holes into my throat with either a knife or an ice pick. He had multiple items in an attempt to kill me. Um, he sliced the side of my throat open. You probably can't see it that well, but there it is right there. Um, he bashed the back of my skull open with a hammer, cracking my skull open in order to finish killing me. And he attempted to cut off both of my hands and was able to saw down to the bone on both of them. His main goal was to keep my hands as trophies, um, have other parts of me as memorabilia, and other parts of me to have as food. Okay, so he was going to eat parts of your body? Yes, that's what he confessed. You were in a coma for several days, and he he severed the tendons and ligaments and uh, all of the veins and arteries in, in your hands, I mean, in your wrist and all, so you had to go through a lot yeah. of rehab for that. And I still don't have full capabilities in one of my hands slash wrist area. Well, that's just absolutely horrific. Now, let me ask you, this was someone that you met on a dating app, but yet you, you say that you're still on dating apps now. What's your rationale for being back on dating apps? Yes, I was hurt 
by someone from a dating app, but not everyone on dating apps is a serial killer. So maybe one day I could find someone, if that's possible, hopefully one day. Have you been on some dates? I have. Um, How are they going? Um, I mean, I'm still single, so I guess I kind of shows how that's ended some people will recognize me from the news or they will look at the scars on my wrist and on my body and just think i did it to myself and then they will get uncomfortable and just basically not talk to me because of the incidents because it makes them uncomfortable and that's just kind of one of the ways that it's affected me okay Uh, well we're going to take a break hold on i'd like you to stay with us if if you will yeah coming up we're going to add a woman to the conversation who says she would rather be single than ever use a dating app again we'll meet her and find out next asked me to deposit a check for $85,000. Four business days later, the bank said this was a fraudulent check, but we're confiscating every penny you have to your name. My next guest, Christine, turned to a dating app after her divorce. She says her time was limited working from home and raising three children, so she thought, well, um, I'll... I'll give this a, a shot. It's, it is efficient. Uh, she connected with a man that she fell in love with, but what she didn't see coming was how he scammed her out of $85,000. And that is hard to see coming. And sometimes if that's who they are, if that's what they do, they're really really good at it and he was really good at it right he was extremely good you know i think in the other cases you were attacked by somebody and you couldn't have prevented it and that's why i think sharing my story is really embarrassing because looking back now i can see where i should have done things differently um but there's no way that this was this first time this person's first time They were way, way too good. But yeah, we had met on the app and we were just talking and texting. He always had some excuse for why we couldn't meet in person, why we couldn't FaceTime. I spoke with him on the phone, but it was 99% texting back and forth. But the conversation was so engaging and he was asking questions unlike anybody else had. So I trusted him. He built my trust up over time. The first time he said he needed $500 for his daughter, so I sent it to him PayPal and he paid me back. The next time it was something like $1,500, I did it, he paid me back. I had no reason not to trust him. So the big one was he was working supposedly a job and asked me to deposit a check for $85,000 into my bank account. So I deposited the $85,000, the bank immediately made $500 available for withdrawal. Two business days later, the bank made the full $85,000 available in my account. So in my brain, I assumed that meant that the check had cleared. The bank wouldn't make that much money available if it had. So he asked me to wire $82,000 and that I could keep three just for helping him out. So I did the wire transfer. And then four business days later, the bank said, oops, our fault. This was a fraudulent check we never received the funds from the check issuer. So not only are you liable for it, but we're confiscating every penny you have to your name. So imagine me, single mom with three little kids. I couldn't buy groceries, I couldn't pay my mortgage, I couldn't pay our bill, like what was I supposed to do? I'm blessed because my family stepped in to help out, but this whole time, this individual was telling me there must be a mistake with the bank, or I'll talk to my boss, so that must be the problem. I love you so much, we're gonna work through this, don't worry about it, but I'm in tears, like I'm out every dime I have. It would have been a lot easier if he just took the money and ran. It's that whole next six weeks where he's still convincing me he loves me, you know, that really, really hurts. You say that this Mark ghosted you and then messaged you saying his real name is William, and that he is from 
Nigeria and part of an organized theft group targeting women on dating apps. Correct. Why, why do you think he did that? As, as naive as this sounds, a part of me would really like to believe that it's because he really did love me and that he really did feel bad that he left my kids and I in this situation. But I'm not dumb. I know that it's probably all a lie, but it's just... It's the emotional piece of it. It's like taking every dollar I have, like that's one thing, but never being able to trust anybody again. That's why I can't do dating sites anymore. These truly are really skilled professionals. They're really good at this. It makes me feel dumb because I think I'm a smart person. According to the FBI, there is a major new category of crypto dating scams where fraudsters convince people to put their money into fake cryptocurrency investments. More than $7.7 billion was stolen in cryptocurrency fraud worldwide in 2021. I don't, I don't know that this helps, but I, I can tell you, I know you say things to yourself that it's like, how, how could you? But the truth is, these truly are really skilled professionals. They understand how the bank works. They understand how the clearing houses work. They understand what the timing is. And he did invest seed money. He, he got, he asked for some money. You gave it to him. He paid it back to build trust. He asked for a little bit more. He paid it back to build trust. Then he didn't ask for a large sum of money. He gave you the money and your bank put that in your account. They didn't say we're gonna hold this for collection. They put it in your account. So the whole system really failed you and a very skilled professional that has a lot of experience at this preyed upon you. Uh, you know, they call them con men for a reason, that's short for confidence. They build confidence in people and then they, they prey upon you. And I've worked with the Nigerian ambassadors. We've put people on the ground in Nigeria. They do have a really big combine over there. They work out of work rooms over there. He may have been talking to you and 30 other women at the same time. Sure. You, you, you have no way of knowing. And I've had people here that have lost over a million dollars in this. They've sold their homes. They've cashed in their retirement funds. They've borrowed money. They've sold their furniture. Let me tell you how nefarious these people are. They send these text messages to their targets and They'll use broken English. They'll say, I'm from Idaho, but I'm stuck overseas on a construction project. And they'll send them a message that say, I, I love you, my heart and soul, moon, sun. They leave out articles and stuff. And I've asked them before. I've talked to these people and said, look, you've got grammar and spell check on your computer just like we do. Why do you not at least correct your crummy grammar. And they say, oh no, that's a screening tool. If we have somebody that we tell we're from Idaho and we use that broken English and they're willing to overlook that, we know we have a live one. They use these things as tools to spot who they need to invest their time in. They're really good at this. It makes me feel dumb because I think I'm a smart person. <laughs> you are a smart person, but you're not looking for, it, it's like working with a magician. They give you misdirection and they tell you things that you would expect to hear in a relationship, that you want to hear in a relationship. And that's why they choose who they do. Someone that's been through divorce or they've been through they're a widower or a widow, a man or woman. They, they find someone that's experienced loss, gone through something, they know they're alone after a loss, and they, they target just those people. So 
just know they're really good at this. They're kind of borrow eighty five thousand dollars. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm real good at this too. <laughs> We're going to add another uh, woman to this conversation. For her, a first date turned into a nightmare. Now he is in prison for life. What happened on this terrifying night out? We'll talk to Kelly next. One of my worst dates from a dating app was there was this guy that I swiped right on. His profile was everything that I was looking for. Kind of like a preppy look, he seemed really normal. When I met up with him on the first date, he was completely different than his pictures. He was all in black, skull rings, black nail polish. He showed me pictures on his phone, what his bedroom looked like, and there was a coffin in the middle of his bedroom. From that moment, in my head, I was like, I need to get out of here. Like, this is never gonna go anywhere. I was like, listen, I had to wake up early for work. And he was like, oh no, I, I booked a surprise for us. And he said he booked a magic show. He got so drunk, it was really loud, obnoxious. It was so embarrassing. And right when I was about to go to the bathroom and never come back, he grabbed my face, bit my lips so hard, like a vampire, and I pushed him off, ran to the bathroom, called my friend, and never returned. That was my worst date. Well, Kelly says she met a man on a dating site who appeared to be successful, kind, polite, guy next door type. After texting with him for a week, they met for a date, but after he walked her to her car, the unthinkable happened. This was something that you didn't see coming at all. No. Um, like you said, he was the boy next door. Um, being cut, our conversation was very polite. He invited me to go have a drink. It was probably about 6 o'clock, and it was a quick little drink just to get to know each other. Uh, again, uh, I met him at this busy bar grill place. It was... Again, normal conversation about our lives, very polite. Um, I had a beer, but I had about two sips because when I get nervous, I tend to ramble on. So I didn't have time to have it anymore to drink. And then after about an hour, we got up. And again, he was still being very courteous, very polite. Um, I'm about to walk out to my car. And he was six, about 6'4", six, I'm 5'4". Uh, he then put his arm around my waist and pulled me into his car and spooked me. You didn't put yourself in harm's way. You didn't meet this guy off somewhere alone. You didn't go to some remote place or location. You, you met in a busy place. Yeah, it was very busy. There was a game on, I think. Um, yeah. I parked underneath a streetlight um, right in front, trying to be safe. And do you believe that he had this in his mind from the beginning? Now I do. Um, at the time, absolutely not. Um, but uh, now knowing what I know now, knowing what has happened since, yes, was absolutely planned. Yeah. He was charged. He is now in prison. Yes. And, we, and a lot was discovered besides this situation, correct? Yes. I actually ended up, I was uh, convinced to drop the charges uh, by the police after a while. Um, I seeked therapy and I found an amazing therapist who really got me back on track. Um, I got a call from an assistant district attorney in Atlanta about two years later t telling me he has struck again multiple times. I participated in a trial that he was involved in, and at the end of it, we got him sentenced to two consecutive life sentences. Yeah. Now, he was married? He was, yes. With children? Yes. If you're dealing with a... a predator, particularly a, a serial offender mm -hmm. like this, they're going to develop skills to disarm Absolutely. someone and get you to take your guard down. And there have been times when I have interviewed criminals from muggers to rapists, um, and they, will, they have told me one thing that's very consistent. 
and that is that they rely on your shock in the moment to get the advantage. Mm -hmm. Just a mugger on the street, when they walk up and say, hey, do you have the time? That second that you look down at your watch, that's their opportunity to hit you in the head or to gain the physical advantage. And the reason is you don't have an evil mind. Mm -hmm. So there's that few seconds where your mind can't conceive of the evil nature that is where they live. They live in that dark nature. So they're already there. They know what they're going to do. And in those few seconds where you're saying, this is happening, where you freeze for those few seconds, that's all they need because they're already in action. It's your goodness that they prey upon. Up next, we're going to talk to a woman who says dating apps are too dangerous and need to change because there are too many scams, catfishers, and assaults. So what's the solution? We'll talk about that next. Last year, I met a guy on a dating app and we dated for about four months. Things seemed to be going really well and I thought I was even developing feelings for him until one day he texted me a link asking me to go to this resort with him for the weekend and it was a nudist resort. I was so scared. I was like, oh, no, thank you. I never talked to him again. We're talking about dating apps and how they have become addictive and even dangerous. And I want to introduce writer and director of the HBO documentary, Swiped. Now, Nancy Joe has researched dating apps and says they are not made to find love. That's not the purpose. They're not there, uh, Nancy Joe, to quench people's need. And in fact, they're there to get them addicted, and that's part of the intermittent reinforcement schedule that they're designed around, correct? Yes. The marketing for dating apps is so powerful because they tap into our deepest need for love and connection. Meanwhile, their actual business model is to get you addicted to the app and to actually have a relationship with the app itself. That's why you see people on them multiple hours a week. They're designed in you know, very pointedly to addict you, to get your serotonin levels jumping and the swiping, you know, gets, gets your whole neurological system excited about matching. And there are lots of people actually who use dating apps a lot and never even meet anyone in person. They just go on the app itself because it just becomes, quote unquote, fun to play the game. You think this really sets men up to treat women kind of as a commodity. Um, I think that everybody is treated as a commodity, but I do notice in my research and interviews with people that, and there have been many studies at this point that show that women do tend to get treated very badly on these apps. You know, you mentioned in your really great introduction about the levels of harassment, the levels of non-consensually shared graphic images, you know, the kind of abusive behavior that happens just on the app itself, which, by the way, leads to unhappiness in daily life. It's not just these terrible, terrible stories that these people have been brave enough to share today that happen on apps. It's how you feel every day. You talk about scams. I mean, dating apps, there are lots of romance scams. They're called on dating apps, but dating apps are the biggest scam of all because they lure you in. In the beginning, they were free. Now they're not free, but, you know, it's, it's just... It's very similar to a slot machine or something like that, you know, or, or a gambling game where, well, you, you can get more chips if you just do this, or you can, get more, you can get more matches, you can get more swipes, you can get more this, you can get more that. If you just pay this next level, you can get on to the next level and you have a higher chance of love. No, it's not true. Julie, what do you want to say? Um, talking about how you mentioned the lowering of the self-esteem, do you think that it kind of has an effect on how people organically walk up to people in the day-to-day -day life? Do you think people resort to the technology more than, oh, I see this person walking across the street, let me go talk to them. Do you think that has a big impact? Great question, fantastic question, yes. 
this is changing the way that we date and mate. It's upending a 10 to 15,000 year um, evolutionary process by which we you know, evolve to meet people and, and form bonds and social connections and relationships. This has changed the way people interact in real life to the extent where I've interviewed so many people who say that they, they don't go up to someone at the gym or in a bar or where, wherever you might use to meet someone, they will just go on an app. People have told me that they will go on an app in a bar. A good friend of mine is, is here today. Linus, there are real people out there that aren't predators that still have communication skills and can meet and talk other than on apps, right? I mean, there are still people out there. Absolutely. And first of all, I'm sorry to hear some of these horrible stories. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry. But no, there are some good people on there. There are serial, really nice, unique um, people out there. This is one of my calls for, for the dating app industry. They need to vet. They also need to have age checks because there are underage people on there who are making fake profiles because kids like to experiment. They like to see what's going on on the apps. And I've talked to, you know, underage people who've talked with adults, met with adults, and had terrible things happen to them as well. So, I mean, yes, you're right. Absolutely. There are good people on these apps. But the companies need to think about the worst case scenario, not the best case scenario. They like to compare themselves to bars. They say like, well, it's just really like a bar. If you came into our bar, you know, like whatever happens to you in the bar. No, it's not like a bar. There are algorithms that like um, connect you with the person. It's a powerful tool. It's a dangerous tool. As they say, with over great power comes great responsibility. You have to be responsible to yourself to not put yourself out there in those kind of situations. It's a powerful tool and sometimes we forget how dangerous it is. It puts you in front of the whole world and you forget about that. You, you, you develop this relationship and emotional connection with, with the phone, not, not with the other person. You go out there, you download the app, and you expect it to protect you. Your point is somebody, everybody, needs to be really careful who they're allowing to be on their app. And if somebody is allowing a serial rapist, a con artist, a scammer, uh, to get on their app, they, they've got to find some way to filter those people, to find those people. And of course, if they haven't been discovered yet, that's hard to do. But some of these people, like one woman, there was a registered sex offender on there the app. A that's, a, yes. that's a fairly low bar. There are a um, lot of registered sex offenders on these apps, and there's been studies about it, and they don't do anything about it. In fact, they're repeat customers. They go, they bump them, they go to other apps. The reason why they don't vet is because they don't have to, because there's an internet law called Section 230. It's a very controversial law that says that third party platforms are not responsible for what third parties do on their apps. Mm -hmm. It's a really controversial law, it needs to be changed. But they don't have to do it. They, they don't, they can't get sued. So they don't really spend any money doing anything about it. Your point is the apps need to have some level of security, some level of screening for who gets on the app. And they won't do it. So there needs to be congressional investigations, I think. Couldn't agree with you more. I want to thank all of my guests today. For more information about this episode, or if you'd like to share your story, log on to drphil.com. If you want to add your voice to the conversation, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Not on a dating app. <laughs> I will not be there. I've been married for 46 years, and I intend to stay that way. So you won't find me on a dating app. If you're in the Los Angeles area or you plan to be, we'd love to have you join us here on stage in our studio audience. Uh, just go to drphil.com, click on Be Part of the Audience for all the details. Don't forget to follow and subscribe to my podcast, Still in the Blanks. Today, I'm speaking with Michael Schellenberger, author of San Francisco, Why Progressives Ruin Cities. Be sure to check out I've Got a Secret with Robin McGraw. You can find them both on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. I hope you'll come back when we have more time to talk about some of these things because this is clearly 
the way people are meeting, and we need to make sure everybody is as educated about it as Thank we possibly can. Thank you. I'm so glad can. you did this show. And I hope you'll come back and talk more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, stay safe. We'll see you next time. So